but it is a great pleasure to be here with you for this very special occasion. It's an occasion that marks a, an enormous amount of history for IRIS. As you probably know, Ian Barbour is one of the great people of science and religion. He was around at the beginning, he's around at the middle, and he's around today with us. And it was very special. He started right with the very beginning of IRIS uh, and continued to contribute in many, many ways through his insights and understanding of science and religion. There were numerous, just numerous, to every, at every turn, if you want to look at a field that now exists within the academic world, every single book, every single paper, all either uh, emanate from uh, references to his work or direct derivatives of references to his work. So this is a remarkable human being and we are very privileged to have you with us today and, and to share with you and with us. And of course, not only did he, was he at the beginning of Iris, he published in the very first volume of Zygon. And, and in the first issue of Zygon. So, and, and he continued to be an editorial advisor to Zygon for many, many, many years. So it's quite an amazing thing that we're coming up very close to the 50th anniversary of Zygon as a publication, the premier publication of a real journal in the world. And, in religion and science, and I'm certain you'll hear more about that. Some of you have already heard about that as well. And there is a whole series of, of works that he's done, and we're going to hear about his, his lectures today. But in particular, I want to just remind you, of course, that he did receive the World Religion Prize, now the Templeton Prize, for uh, Progress of World Religion uh, in the 1990s. And it's very exciting that, that his work was uh, so highly recognized and that, and that he has an opportunity to see how that has uh, moved ahead. And I'm hoping by his presence today and his insights that honestly I think have changed since he's been exposed to, to so much of what you've had to say in this room and the questions and the concerns and the, and the plenary sessions that he's attended that I think there's going to be some more because I know he added some new slides to the, to the <laughs> series and I'm excited to see what they have to say as well. But I think that the first thing is, is that I'd like to call upon, I just realized I'm, calling, I'm, I'm stealing some of your thunder, Carl, and I apologize to you because Carl Peters knows this history so much better than me. I'm going to ask him to uh, introduce our guest speaker today and, and our honored guest. Please, Carl. Well, Carl is, well, Carl is saying that he too is with the beginning of, of virus and certainly with the Zygon. Not quite at the very beginning, but enough to say that here is one of the great treasures that we have that has continued with us in so many different ways. And Carl Peters represents. Uh, in a sense, the true spirit of what IRIS is all about. And, and it's just a great pleasure to have him in the room to introduce Ian today. Uh, at the universities in Beijing. 
Even though they were Episcopalians and Presbyterians, somehow he had became uh, a Congregationalist or a member of the United Church of Christ. I'm not sure how that worked. Uh, and, and maybe he can uh, tell us a little bit about that part of his journey. Ian spent his childhood in China and uh, the United States and also in England. Uh, he then went on into higher education and uh, received a bachelor's degree in physics from Swarthmore. Uh, a master's degree uh, from Master of Science uh, in Physics from Duke University. Uh, and in 1950, he earned his PhD at the University of Chicago in high energy nuclear physics. Uh, he was a teaching assistant of Enrico Fermi, one of the giants in physics at that time. From Chicago, he became the department chair of physics at Calico Zoo College, but after four years, uh, he wanted to expand his vision from, from science uh, into the broader sphere, uh, into issues of ethics and uh, ultimate meaning, uh, and therefore went to Yale University, uh, which was an excellent place for him to be, uh, good philosophy, good theology uh, departments, uh, and he earned his Master of Divinity degree there in 1956. From Yale, he went to Carleton College as both a professor of religion and a professor of physics. Uh, and uh, he then basically spent his career teaching at one of the finest colleges in the United States of America. He is now uh, emeritus as of 1986. He's emeritus as the, uh, the Winifred and Atherton Dean a Professor of Science, Technology, uh, and Society. Now my experience with Eon started in 1966. Uh, I had for my own reasons decided that I really wanted to focus my doctoral studies on science and religion. Uh, and so I went and saw one of the university professors at Columbia University, a man named Joseph Blau. And when I expressed my interest, he said, well, you should read two things. You should read this new book, Issues in Science and Religion, by Ian Barber. Uh, and you should start reading this new journal, Zygon Journal of Religion and Science. Uh, both came out in 1966, right when I was beginning my studies. Uh, and I could say that that is the primary reason why I'm here with you today. Uh, I really appreciated Ian's scope. I mean, he was a master at basically covering the wide view uh, in great detail, uh, but also in very precise language. Uh, his issues in science and religion, you know, outlined some of the history of science and religion uh, in the last few centuries before the 20th. I then developed uh, some excellent chapters on methods of knowing in science and religion. Uh, and then he went through the physical and the biological and the human sciences, in each case outlining major topics, presenting different perspectives or points of view, uh, and then summing up in terms of conclusions for philosophy and theology. So at the same time as he was doing this comprehensive summary, he also began to develop his own position, which at the end of the book became clear to me uh, as a process theology or a process metaphysics in which the philosophy united and integrated the science on the one hand and the religious tradition of Christianity primarily, but of the West on the others, although he's also paid attention to other traditions in the world's religions. Now you can see some evidence of this in the handouts that you have. Don't want you to read them now, but, but what you have are his two Gifford lectures. I should say something about the Gifford lectures. They are perhaps the most prestigious lectureship uh, in the areas of philosophy, science, and theology. Going way back into the 19th century, an example of a Gifford lecture is William James's variety of religious experience. And so what you have there are two outlines of the books that resulted uh, from his different lectures, Religion in an Age of Science and Ethics in an Age of Technology. Now in science and religion circles, I think ethics in an age of technology has not been paid anywhere near the attention it deserves. 
I remember when it came out, an economics professor at Rollins College, where I taught, came up to me one day and said, you know, I'm using this excellent book in one of my courses on economics and value. It's Ian Barber's book on ethics in an age of technology. Uh, he actually had read it even before I got to it. So uh, uh, the, the scope of that book is remarkable, and actually much of the thinking in there, I think, predates the kind of thinking that we're doing in this conference today. Well, in 1999, Ian received, as Saul said, the prestigious Templeton Prize for Progress in Religion. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with that prize, uh, John Templeton established, he's the establishment of the Templeton Mutual Funds and one of the early establishers of mutual investment funds. Uh, he essentially wanted to create a prize that was the equivalent of a Nobel Prize in religion. Uh, and he felt that religion was more important, I um, may not agree with him, but in any of the sciences, and so that prize uh, uh, is a greater monetary value uh, and consistently has remained so than any of the Nobel Prizes. Uh, Ralph Burho, founder of IRIS, received that Templeton Prize in 1980. Uh, and um, probably too much later, really, you should have gotten that sooner. <laughs> you received it in 1999. Um, and uh, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity. Regarding the Templeton Prize, uh, John Cobb Jr., uh, one of the preeminent theologians, Protestant theologians of the 20th and early 21st century, summed it up this way. He wrote, no contemporary has made a more original, deep, and lasting contribution toward the needed integration of scientific and religious knowledge and values than Ian Barber, with respect to the breadth of topics and fields brought into this integration, Barber has no equal. It's with really great pleasure, Ian, uh, that I invite you up to share with us uh, your thoughts and video uh, on your work in science and religion. Uh, are 
perpetuating those two early uh, luminaries who, from both the scientific and religious side, uh, proposed uh, the organization. Um, the, the Zygon, uh, first editor, of course, was Burrow himself, and then Carl Peters for many years. Uh, after that, uh, Phil Hefner at LSTC and the Zygon Center in Chicago, and currently Ben Dries, who we're going to hear. So four very capable editors over the years who have drawn in other people, non-IRIS members and IRIS members, contributing to a journal that's made a, a very important impact. And if we can put my PowerPoint on, I will just sketch in a little more detail my understanding of the main themes in the history.
kind of religious naturalism that uh, among its very, very adherents oh, would be Ralph Perho himself, uh, perhaps in a more philosophical thing, Carl Peters thought, Ursula Goodenough, who unhappily couldn't be here, but her sacred depths of nature uh, is, is a very powerful expression of, of uh, religious humanity. You've got a bit of it in Brian Swimmy's uh, movie, if you were not at the Boathouse the other night. So for, for all those reasons, I think, we have all wanted to use the word religion rather than theology uh, in our title. Well, as you go down this list, uh, you'll see the 64 um, conception and the 66 launching of the um, journal, whereas I had uh, been working a little bit before that on, uh, my book was published in 66, and you'll see I go back and forth between science and religion and ethics and technology. 1970, uh, and more popularly oriented book. Uh, 73, I edited a book. I apologize for talking of Western man rather than Western people or whatever. Uh, that uh, was looking at attitudes towards nature and technology as they were reflected in various relig uh, religious and secular traditions. And then in 74, a more methodological book, um, Myths, Models, and Paradigms, that dealt with the interaction between philosophy of science, essentially, and philosophy of religion. How, how much similarity is there and how much difference is there in these two philosophical treatments of, of, of our two primary fields of, of science and religion. So now this should be able to bring me the next uh, uh, slide, if I just push on here, yeah, got it. So this continues the, the, uh, the dates of the 1980 book that was getting over more into the technology side. And I notice they use the word human values. I'll say something about that in a moment. A value I take to be a either personal or social uh, policy towards making decisions. Uh, either in one's own life or, or in the uh, body politic. Uh, then in 89, the first volume of the uh, different lectures, which you've got a copy of, uh, of the outline of, and then uh, the second volume, and then a more popular book on uh, when science meets religion using the four typology, fourth typology. Um, uh, of conflict and, and uh, of independence and um, dialogue and integration, that fourfold uh, typology that's fairly widely quoted. And it seems to work around the world, though I had an interesting conversation with, with uh, the Raman here because I received uh, some emails from Hindu scholars. And I would get one saying, uh, I found your type, typology very applicable to the Hindu uh, context. And then I get another one saying, uh, you are incurably Western because you always have an either or, and we always have a uh, <laughs> both and. And I asked Vivi uh, uh, which of those he thought was most important, and he said both and. <laughs> So, so uh, that, that typology has been apparently found useful by um, other people. So then, uh, the 201 is the 2001 is my most recent book. But I would point out that during the 2000s, uh, both Iris and Zygon have continued to have an interest in both science and religion including lots of attention to religious naturalism, particularly to evolution and neuroscience, which I think are the fields that produce problems for some theistic believers, but for others also, and also technology and ethics. Uh, and you've had recent con uh, summer conferences on energy and water, and today on agriculture, and. Um, 
give you some attention to genetic modification. So that that, that technology and ethics uh, thread or stream, uh, I think you've continued. And I want to say first that, that one can to some extent separate them, but in the last analysis one has to say you can't really separate them because each affects the others and get a more comprehensive view. Whichever one you're focusing on, you have to keep the other one in mind. So let's just see what we've got here. Now. Yeah, that's religion in the age of science, ethics in the age of technology, and uh, in agriculture, uh, for example, um, I started off talking about food and hunger and the causes of hunger, the environmental constraints on agriculture, and I look at Western agriculture, talking about family farms and rural life, and the way those have been impacted by industrial farming methods and so forth, and then under two, the agribusiness and research priorities, which uh, are to such a large extent determined by the by the large uh, the industrial interests, and the movements towards a sustainable agriculture, and then looking at agriculture in the third world, the Green Revolution and its health in many ways, but also its problems in relation to malnutrition and, and environmental impact. And finally, bringing in the ethical values that I will tell you more about later, um, the way in which ethical principles can come to bear on those choices, and then the translation into national policy. Uh, so that, that, that was my, I'll just show you my energy uh, chapter. Um, chapter on fossil fuels, oil and global justice, coal and environment. You'll be glad to know that there are three pages on um, global warming. Today we're going to give more than that, but at least uh, uh, global warming was looked at, in, particularly in relation to fossil fuel. Nuclear power, issues of reactor safety and risk accessibility, acceptability. Uh, radioactive waste and future generations. Uh, we heard this morning that uh, the one needs to be concerned not just about the present and distribution in the present, but about what the impacts on, on future generations will be. That's one of the points where I think a, a religious perspective has a lot to contribute because it takes a long term view. Every, almost every religious tradition has a sense of its ancestors and its, its this about its origins and takes a very long term view, whereas all so many other frameworks take a short term view. Politics can barely look beyond the next election, uh, economic uh, decisions. Uh, this year's bottom line, uh, or this quarter's bottom line, uh, at any future costs and benefits are discounted uh, at a high rate. So goes only very slightly into the future if it's taken into account at all. So uh, then under renewable resources, the question of solar energy and, and its relation to sustainability <coughs> and the advantages of some forms of solar but also some other energy sources in decentralization and participation in the decisions. I understand freedom to be participatory freedom primarily freedom to participate in the decisions that affect ourselves, not freedom as total autonomy or uh, assuming that, that uh, one only needs to look at the, at the, at the individual, or freedom as absence of, of governmental constraints. That, that, I mean, that's, that negative view of freedom is hands off, don't touch me. Uh, which I think is so widespread, particularly on the both religious and political right, who understand freedom as, as uh, let me do my own thing. Uh, but to see that in this day and age, uh, government can have a constructive role, and that it's participating in the decisions that affect you, both at the local and national and global level. Uh, Finally, conservation, the relation of energy to economic development, lifestyles and personal fulfillment. 
because one of the values that I talk about is personal fulfillment and energy in the third world. So that's, uh, that's what I did a few years ago. But not to complicate it, I think you've got to say, as a first cut, religion and science under relationship one, uh, we were talking about, and ethics and technology under relation two, and we've been treating them as separate. I think that's a, where, where you perhaps need to start, and, and the way you've alternated uh, summer conferences. But relation three, religion is not independent of ethics, because every um, religious tradition has upheld certain values, has a certain vision of what true fulfillment is. Um, and today, when so many people choose to reintegrate themselves in a different way of distribution, whether it may be through Buddhist meditation or maybe through uh, some other form uh, of identification with a tradition that was not the one one grew, grew up in necessarily. People do not do choose, and often it's because of an ethical uh, issue that they find themselves at home in one tradition or another. And of course, every religion has a load of, of, of ethical uh, insights, as well as baggage that they uh, could do without, or of course, often have very high ideals, but that are not very well looked up to. But uh, that, that three uh, roots, so to speak, of interaction, uh, is, I think, very important. Uh, we'll often derive ethics partly from a religious context, but I will say in a moment also it's related to science. Well, uh, over the right for uh, science and technology uh, are often so intimately related. Uh, some people think of science uh, as being the root of technology, the, Invention, make an invention, then you just apply it. But actually, technology is often relatively independent, grows out of practical needs, practical work. Uh, the lens grinders in Holland who, who discovered uh, the telescope, which Galileo then used to see the mountains on the moon and the phases of Venus, Venus and the moons of Jupiter. Uh, the microscope that lets you look down into the very small organisms. Uh, so very often, uh, technology um, isn't just derived from science, but feeds into science. The uh, reactor, the, excuse me, the uh, racetrack at CERN uh, on the border of uh, Switzerland and uh, France uh, would not have been possible without uh, the superconductors that let you, uh, at very low temperatures, reduce the current needed to produce a given magnetic field. But on the other hand, that leads to the uh, discovery of the uh, Higgs boson. And just see how amazing that is that a, a particle that was predicted 40 years earlier by Higgs. Uh, they're virtually certain that, that they pinned it down and got its energy within, a, within a, its mass within a fairly small range. So, so the, the, the uh, laboratory at CERN is a good example of, of the, uh, the two-way interaction between uh, uh, some people see technology as the determining factor, technological determinists who who, who say that everything uh, grows out of the technology and it provides the economic uh, uh, leverage and it uh, and others uh, I, I think one's got to say it all depends on the context and I, I would take a, a contextual view so that neither the technological optimists which include many engineers uh, who identify with industry any problem the technology creates, it will solve. Uh, and that's the, uh, uh, the or the, so the, the more pessimistic people, if 
from the counterculture or from other uh, groups who who think the, the, the bad fallout, the deleterious fallout from technology is so serious that the technological progress is, is always marred or to some extent almost undermined. So we should go back to a simpler life without technology. That's impossible. But uh, th those those relationships. And let me say, um, if I were revising this diagram, as I think I ought to, I ought to write way to the right society, the line going up to science and to technology, and the same at the left society with a line from religion and ethics, because these are all uh, embedded in society. Uh, the scientist says he's only pursuing truth, and, but in fact uh, he's being subsidized by a corporation or a university, some, some vested interests in his work. Uh, uh, so, so the social context, uh, uh, it's not just a set of ideas. These are people, the, the engineer and the, and the scientist are always part of a community. And you, know, you need to take that into account. The same with the left, that, that religion is, at, is interacting with the, with the wider society, with uh, public education, for example, and how much influence in public education should a religious group have. Uh, so that uh, in addition to what's on the, uh, have I talked about, well, I haven't talked about five, which is, uh, Relation of religion to technology, uh, church groups who acquire the technology and have their uh, video screens and their musical, and then maybe televising the service or whatnot, and these in turn influence them. If, if the preacher is being televised, he, he has a different for, uh, format and, and presentation. So there are various relations between religion and technology. Between science and ethics, relationship six, um, there are people who want to derive science from ethics. Um, there were people who thought that the ideals of science could provide the ideals for society. Uh, integrity, uh, openness to other views. Uh, it was a good idealized uh, view, but um, this was presented by C.P. Uh, Snow at one point, though, and by uh, a number of people who uh, others said, no, uh, uh, ethics must be willing to, to deny uh, what, what you see in uh, nature. Uh, there are attempts to derive evolutionary ethics, um, Simpson, for example, uh, but others who say no. Shirley Huxley says uh, you may you may part of evolutionary advance is being able to make decisions in a cultural setting, somewhat independent of science. But that that's a fruitful dialogue, and that's gone on in uh, Iris over the years. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a very, uh, very interesting thing that, uh, and of course all the people who like uh, Dawkins uh, uh, think you can, uh, think that you can explain everything at the genetic level, so it gets involved with the reductionistic tendency to see genetics as the, and the, particularly the uh, human origins in hominid species, to say that any pattern that was um, developed in uh, hominid times, uh, maybe in the savannah uh, area of Africa, uh, we inherit and we can blame on our misunderstanding, our misbehaviors, uh, uh, that, that we're in a different ecology now and uh, that we're basically formed in that earlier period. So there are lots of Discussions going on on uh, extended genetic determinism, 
recognizing that we're much more limited in our choices than we once thought we were, but attempting uh, to perhaps defend some concept of, of at least a limited free will that we're not totally genetic. Uh, genetic partly because we can choose our own environments. This is a, uh, a new understanding of evolution, and it doesn't just stress natural selection. It's actually, of course, it's terribly important, but it looks also at, now this could be a whole lecture, so I'll give you two minutes. Uh, the the, the um, uh, attempt to see that there are levels of analysis in evolution from the selection by the environment of adaptive features to the importance of developmental process and uh, the ways in which not the DNA as sort of the, 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 the only determiner of, of the future, but the developmental sequence in which reaction to the environment and in which the child's uh, continuing interaction, so that the mind, this was Teske's uh, theme a few years back, uh, the, the extended mind, the uh, mind-body integration, but particularly that our self is embodied, but also extended. Even the idea of extended mind, that, that we have to think of our mind as not just stopping it with our skin, but much less than just our, with our brain, even with the body and the mind, that we're formed by our interactions. As you can see, with a small child who, who's learning by doing and is learning a lot from that interaction. So the motors, the motor abilities are very central in the development of new cognitive abilities, uh, the feedback from, from those kinds of interactions. So that, that whole uh, uh, complex, uh, but I mustn't, I mustn't dwell on that. Um, let me uh, move on to the last uh, more detailed than us. I wanted to just look at, at the types of ethics, both uh, in terms of the way I've, I've analyzed it, but also in terms of, the, of the, this conference, where, where is it drawn from, and other um, Saigon and Iris related uh, utilitarian ethics, uh, judges by the consequences, intentions don't matter, we don't take rights into account, we just look at the consequences. Uh, and in one tradition, you try to maximize total welfare, total happiness, and some other kinds of tradition. Only the uh, total factor matters. You don't take distribution, particularly into account, so you probably have to supplement it with some kind of uh, distributive justice ideal. Because if you could get more total happiness by, let's say, subjecting these children to experiments with a, with a damaging drug, and it's not very many children, so uh, the total uh, and the possible benefit to millions of others uh, of subjecting, let's say, a growing child to an experimental drug, uh, if you don't have some concept of rights protecting the individual and look only at the total, uh, you could probably justify some things we wouldn't want to justify. So you probably have to, uh, uh, and particularly when you come to maximizing GDP, uh, which of course says nothing about how it's distributed, you can increase the GDP and, and part of the population can be falling. Uh, and you can have increasing gaps between the very rich and the very poor with the same <coughs> GDP. And you don't take externalities into account, what the economists call externalities, the pollution of the, of the air that your company doesn't directly uh, take into account in, in any of its balance sheets. Uh, you do cost-benefit analysis, that's the uh, economist's uh, favorite quite often. You can even try to convert some of the health effects into a economic figure, assigning certain value to human life and, and uh, 
But again, it says nothing about how it's distributed, and it uh, uh, doesn't take the long-term future into effect. And also, you could try to you build a dam and you take uh, its water uh, control features and its seasonal leveling features and its recreational features. You try to uh, add those all up and quantify them. Uh, and I think that proves to be less than totally useful because particularly you leave out so much. It's, I mean, it's unquantifiable or that, uh, that you're pretty arbitrary in the way you're assigning those. Uh, so you move perhaps to a different kind of ethics. It talks about rights and individuals. It does protect, protect the individual. Uh, Saul has been, and lots of the rest of the speakers, have been very active in the UN Declaration of Human Rights. And that's wonderful. And the rights framework, I think, it, it does give you a kind of global perspective. You still have to ask where do the rights come from? Uh, is it uh, from God, the divine rights of kings, uh, or uh, some other uh, concept of humanity? Or, uh, the, Declaration of, uh, of uh, well, particularly the Bill of Rights in the Constitution. Uh, we say these are natural rights, uh, part of the natural order of things. If they're not God-given, where do they come from? But also, uh, how do you evaluate the, the duties that go with them? Because to every right is a corresponding duty. It's meaningless to talk about a right to food unless you say who is responsible for fulfilling that right. So what duties, what responsibilities does it lead to on others? And uh, I thought uh, Brenton's uh, talk about Catholic natural rights and social justice, which fits well with many of the uh, UN themes, but has, in his case, has a, a motivation coming from the Catholic concern for social justice, and perhaps the conception of natural rights is the origin that's been part of the Catholic tradition. Uh, we've had a lot of talk about context, uh, rights in a cultural context, and particularly in you know, the remarks this morning, uh, put those rights in a variety of contexts, not just sort of the American constitutional rights. Um, and I, I, I think right talk of right and duty has been very fruitful in, certainly Saul has just put a huge amount of work into that, but other, I think almost every speaker so far has uh, referenced the UN Declaration as a point of, of, uh, of uh, concern. But I would, I would say, or would ask, isn't there also a place for looking at value? Let me, before I come to that, there was another approach to ethics that I'm not dealing with yet, which is to talk about virtues. Uh, what virtues does your religious tradition hold up? Uh, it, or it could be talking about ideals. Uh, what do you do with, with the Christian understanding of love? Uh, it's hard to turn that into a right. You can't say there's a right to be loved or a right to love. So rights language doesn't adapt itself very well to, uh, let's say, love as a virtue, character development. Uh, how does one help a growing child to acquire the ideals and that, that kind of element that uh, um, there's also a, an ethics of response and leading to responsibility. Uh, someone like Patricia Lieber at Yale talks about uh, Christianity as being basically our response to what God has done, our accepting life as a gift, our accepting that we're accepted by God. And out of that, we respond by acting towards others with love and action. So the, the various ways that one might approach uh, 
love as something to be sought uh, tend to get left out by this other school. I myself have talked about values, but look on the, on the uh, chart here, um, the, the, um, all of these values, of course, have a social context, but you're looking primarily at the individual. Uh, adequate food and uh, uh, adequate health. Uh, you're looking at the individual, even though always in a social context, as the, as, and the effects uh, and the goals that you want to seek in that area. Meaningful work. Um, I think some concept of personal fulfillment, but that's a little bit trickier. Because what, what do we think fulfillment consists of? Consuming more goods, being more entertained? Or do we think the true fulfillment lies in family interactions and maybe even spiritual meditation and so on? one's concept of what constitutes fulfillment, turning from a consumer society to maybe a small-scale small society in which it is easier for these uh, aspects of family, personal interactions, community resources. Then there's a set of social values, social justice, distributive justice, participatory freedom, and as I said earlier, freedom considered not as absence from interference, not a negative view of freedom. Get off my back, uh, uh, minimum governmental interference, which the right tends to see. But participatory freedom, maybe taking part in the decisions that affect your life, recognizing that you can't be an autonomous individual. Uh, Economic development, I would also include there, though, there are uh, different concepts of development, and development has to include some of these other features, and it also has to be sustainable, so uh, you, you can spell it out in terms of economics. Then I've listed environmental values, resource sustainability, we've had a lot of speakers talk about that, environmental protection, and I think respect for all forms of life have to be added, though that's a little bit harder uh, to deal with because uh, some cultures are so far from, from valuing all life. And also, one has got to put it in the context of some people for whom preserving the life of some other creature may lead to their own deprivation. We have lots of examples from, from bees and uh, anyway, they, they, I, I tend to, uh, to prefer to uh, uh, think of it in terms of, uh, of values. Uh, and so I will um, conclude this section and maybe uh, Katz can help us get uh, on deck a uh, video that was done in London just a little over a year ago. Uh, we, we were convened, uh, people who had won both the Templeton Prize and done the different lectures were asked to say how their mind has changed since giving different lectures. And this guy, this young guy who's the historian for the uh, Gifford Foundation in Edinburgh was interviewing me. And it, he was giving an idea of, it, it, it strictly sticks to the science and religion track. Almost no reference to the ethics and environment track. Uh, and, and, but, but it gives an idea of how I have been thinking on that track, aiming at a more popular audience than you, multiply well-informed people here. But I think you'll get some sense of what I've taken for the last both my whole life as the crucial issues. And then we'll get some commentary from Lim and Carl. No, Lim and uh, Saul. So I'll turn it over to Saul.
going to bring the microphones close so that this can be heard really well.
composed and understanding of nature, not only as dynamic but as multi-layered. Um, does that understanding, that kind of revised understanding of nature, link into this concord between science and the I, I think it does, uh, because if you think of, of reality as a hierarchy of levels with the things that physics studies at the bottom, and then chemistry, and then biology, and then uh, neurology, the brain, and then uh, psychology at the top. Um, it's easy to be reductionistic and say uh, what goes on at this level can be explained by this level. Psychology is just complicated biology. Biology is just complicated physics. And the, 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 the real explanation is in terms of the particles down here. And correspondingly, that uh, causality works upwards so that what, what uh, goes off the lower level determines what goes on in each higher level. And I think there has been a lot of interest recently in the idea of emergence, which is the idea that new phenomena occur at higher levels, and uh, that you have, have to use concepts that don't make any sense in lower levels. Sometimes you can find bridge laws between the levels, but often you can't, and often genuinely novel phenomena at a higher level, and corresponding to the fact that explanations tend to go downward, uh, and often you think of the causality as going upward, but there's been a new interest in what's called bottom-up causality, and combining it with top-down causality, that um, particularly with uh, networks of ideas and uh, the whole idea of systems thinking, uh, that you need to look at uh, whole systems, the, the whole and the part, uh, you can see not just um, uh, in, in terms of the concepts that have to differ, but, but uh, causality. I find an I find a, a interest in, in systems thinking rather than the more mechanistic uh, interaction of the part, but you need to look at the whole so the whole is very definitely great to learn the past. Yeah, it's more holistic, I understand. In a way, it's, it's well, you see, in ecology, you have to look at the whole system and the way two particular species interact are tied in with the uh, way a lot of other species uh, interact. So this, this uh, systems thinking, network thinking, uh, and, and uh, the part behaving differently when it's part of the whole and in turn the whole influencing the part, not by violating the laws of the part, but by setting what the scientists call boundary conditions. Uh, which the parts are pretty right. right. Uh, and, so, and does this idea of top-down causality have anything to offer to our understanding of consciousness and, and of, of personal identity? I, I think uh, I think it does. Uh, traditionally, the, there's been such a sharp division in Western thought between mental and physical, whether it's sort of a spirit, body, dualism in religious terms, or a matter-mind dualism in philosophical terms. Uh, I think. Uh, ever since Descartes in philosophy, this problem of how something is so different, the, the, the mental and, and the physical. But there again, I think, instead of trying to explain what goes on in the brain, just in neural terms, uh, sort of at the bottom, uh, you look at, at, at whole networks, and these networks are um, influential, and again, in the corner of the the bottom up and the top down goes on. What goes on in the network, in that sense, the whole is more than the, some of the parts, but because you get genuinely new phenomena, not just new ideas, new explanatory terms, new concepts, but actually new phenomena, and you start to get into what is agency and what is the self, and you try to find a view of the self that is not just a mind-body dualism, but is more holistic. The self is 
And I think it's actually more biblical too. The self in the Bible is a unitary, psychosomatic, if you want to use an unbiblical term, a unity of willing and acting that goes beyond any sort of materialistic explanation in terms of how the molecules are moving around. I'm not, not denying that the molecules are moving around, but you're looking for, um, I would say, explanatory pluralism because you have different goals in explanation and you can explain in a frame of reference always and when you start talking about human agency, human will, human freedom, which I think you can still uh, defend, you don't have to say it's all determined by either the genes on the one hand or the molecules in the brain on the other, that you can you have um, the, the, the higher levels uh, influencing, not, not causing in any simple one-to-one, -one, but the, the, there are more than just correlations here. There are uh, influences at work uh, between levels, and so they're not separate. And, and so th does this account for emergence and also top-down causality have anything to offer us in terms of understanding God's interaction with creation as well? Uh, well, I, I think you can extend this top-down causality, not that you can get that from science, but the theologian can say, well, maybe something similar is, is going on. God is beyond this world, but God can still interact this world, with this world. So you don't have to say uh, God is up here as a sort of supernatural being intervening to break the laws of nature down here. Uh, you can say God as what's traditionally referred to as the Holy Spirit is present in the world. So there's a greater imminence of God in the world as well as transcendence. You're not saying God is just the world the way the pantheists would, but you're not making a sharp line between God and the world. And so I, I think that the breakdown of the sharp lines the same between human and, and animal life. It used to be such a totally sharp line because you posited a supernatural soul that was unlike anything animals were supposed to have this. Whereas now you can see many of the roots of human behaviors among <coughs> chimps or, or gorillas, but motor motors are particularly interesting. The, the various what's thought to be exclusively human still are somewhat unique to the human, but have their roots lower. Symbolic language seems like it's pretty much restricted to humans, but they've been finding some abilities uh, at symbolic language in, in lower, uh, in particularly in chips, but also in, in, uh, uh, as you look back in the evolutionary tree of this very early hominids, as they're called, and some pre-human, you find the roots of human capacities, not fully developed, but uh, particularly from studying their, their uh, descendants in other species, I think there's been much, a lot of the sharp lines between God and nature, between humans and non-humans, uh, have been breaking down. So, so this is a more imminent panentheist kind of account of it. Yes, yes, I think so. Uh, I think it isn't that much different from what was traditionally thought of as the Holy Spirit, God's presence. God's presence in the natural world, the beginning of, of Genesis, the Spirit hovering over uh, the waters, uh, God's presence in human life, inspiring, that's the Spirit again, uh, in Christ's life. I Christ is inspired by the Spirit and uh, in the life of the community. Uh, and the human spirit, of course, if you're going to think in Trinitarian terms, is also the one non-male member of the Trinity. And I think I've learned a lot from the feminist theologians who said uh, most of theology was written by men. Uh, and most of it was had very much the image of uh, the divine king, the monarch, who controls from above. And the feminists have talked about it, both in human life and in considering God in relation to the world, that uh, you need uh, not a powerless God, but a God who empowers from within uh, 
adjusting this that of human relations. Uh, the ideal is not the, 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 the king, the monarch, who has total control over everything. You know, the, the, the omnipotence, omnipresence, the uh, unchanging, the, the unchanging God. And I've learned from both the process theologians, the uh, later followers of Alfred Whitehead, that uh, God, a God who uh, persuades and empowers rather than a God who controls. So that the determinism either by God from above or by the molecules from below uh, would make human freedom impossible, uh, as well as would allow no role for chance. And uh, I'm impressed with the possibilities of, uh, of talking about God in a less totally supernatural way, a way that, that totally emphasized transcendence. And humanness is always there, but it tended to take a back seat to the, the God who's above the world and uh, the, the, the model of the monarch controlling the subjects. <laughs> is, is there not a risk, any risk of losing the transcendent aspect of God in this kind of imminent framework? That... I think there is, but um, I think a number of things it, 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 as a corrective, it's probably as a corrective for the overemphasis on transcendence. I think you, you can't go too far the other way. Maybe what it himself did in stressing uh, divine imminence. Uh, and I would rather see the transcendent uh, penetrating into the world and empowering rather than controlling. Uh, and that uh, I don't want to power this God, but. Uh, I guess if I had to give up, if you imagine a triangle with with a God's omnipotence, God's power up here, God's love over here, and human evil here, uh, I'd rather give some ground on the power than the love. Uh, so particularly the evil, the human evil, the Holocaust in Germany, I think you've got to say that uh, God doesn't control everything. God allows a lot to happen that, that is evil. So I, I think the greatest problem for the theist is the problem of evil. And I, my own way out, so to speak, or not an answer, but at least a direction, um, is to stress God's love at the expense of God's power. Uh, but a lot of other theologians are saying, a lot of theologians are saying, God can't know the future because the future is unknowable uh, if there's genuine freedom or if there's genuine chance. Uh, the future is simply not knowable. And even though you can try to make a distinction between uh, predestination and predetermination and say God knows all time and therefore can know the future, I think if it, it's, it's, it's can kind of allow real freedom, it does say even God doesn't know what's going to happen. <laughs> so, so this is an intrinsic limitation or the voluntary yeah. limitation? Yes, but it's, it's not a, a, it's, it's voluntary in the sense that it doesn't have something restricting God from outside, but it is not voluntary in the sense that uh, for evolution to occur, for human freedom to occur, uh, God has to uh, avoid uh, determining everything and uh, allowing general freedom. I think this, for the Christian, this is part of the message of the cross. That uh, uh, it may not be God's will directly, but it, it, at least uh, uh, there's room that God participates in that suffering on the cross. So it's not as if God were just a totally distant God, uh, but it is not a God who determines every detail, particularly uh, every, every little thing, which would, uh, I think, make the problem of evil worse, because does God determine the, 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 the hurricanes or the... I mean, it, it, you can hear people, you know, the more conservative side, say, well, that uh, Hurricane Katrina in the U.S. or the... Uh, these are all God's will, and I, I can't see that.
Uh, and uh, you've already said that suffering is intrinsic to evolutionary process and emergence. Is there any way that suffering is intrinsic to God? Or is that going too far? No, I think I, I would want to say that, uh, that God suffers with us. Uh, uh, and that's part of the message of the cross, that, uh, that God is participating in the world uh, and stands with us. Uh, not changing everything, not, not so when my younger brother died, I didn't say, well, that was God's will, even though other people sometimes said to me, it must be comforting to know that was God's will. Um, he died of a brain tumor, I can't say God planning that brain tumor that uh, uh, would have taken him down. I think God was as sorry as I was, though I think sons have been out so wealthy, but I, I really have to have to say that uh, this distant monarchial controlling God uh, is not the God I believe in. Uh, and nor do I think it is the dominant image in the Bible. There are a lot of different images in the Bible and other religious traditions because I'm, I'm open to our learning from, uh, from other religious traditions, things that we might have neglected. I think the Buddhists have been more ecological than we have. Uh, I think uh, the, the Islam Theologians uh, also wrestled with problems of creation and cosmology and some other things. I'm hoping about the years ahead that uh, we'll have more constructive interaction, not just each religion trying to put the other one down, but maybe saying, well, maybe there were some things in your tradition that we could learn from. Uh, maybe the Buddhists could, could learn a little bit about the Christian concern for social justice that has not been as central. I mean, maybe we could move and learn from them about uh, the interdependence of all beings and uh, the compassionate interest in suffering that's part of the Buddhist tradition. So I, I'm, I'm open to learning <coughs> from other traditions as I think I've really been indebted to feminist uh, theologians from some insights that uh, the mainstream has often neglected. Thank you very much Professor Barber for offering us um, a view of, a surprising view of the connections between science and compassion and suffering. like to discuss for a moment. Um, I also would like to just point out that we'll be, uh, we will be taking uh, questions and answers after a couple of brief comments that I make and, and Will makes as well. So I'm going to be um, looking at the time and I want to make sure that there's time for all of you to participate as well. Uh, I'll just say a few things. First is Robert Heilmer and technology and the human prospect. That was the first time that I really got a chance to meet uh, and interact with Ian, and that was in the uh, middle 70s or so, I think, that, that uh, we started, or maybe the late 1970s that we started on that. And we shared a room together in uh, Washington where we had a symposium uh, that was sponsored by Iris at, at the time. And uh, it was a very special occasion. And it was at that time that I learned of your interest in technology and society and of your perspective on values. And so from that point of view, I continue to mature my own thinking on it. And I'll present just one slide today on that. But before I do that, I just wanted to talk about a couple of issues that you mentioned. One is um, the whole issue of top-down and bottom-up causality. I think is a very important theme for a lot of what we've been doing at, at IRIS and, and, in, uh, and in the religion and science world who are interested in evolutionary questions. And in particular, 
uh, my own work that I presented this week, in fact, is a good example, in my opinion anyway, of bottom up and top down with respect to that peaky thread that is uh, the causality, you could argue, about the nutrient qualities of the food uh, of the uh, Hopi and, and the feedback effects and the, re and the interactive feedback effects with the religious tradition. So the, in a sense, you think about the religious tradition overemphasizing a particular dimension of, of cooking, in this case, that actually solves a key problem of survival. So there is, in a sense, the survival of those who practice the religion reinforces the ultimate uh, effects on it and necessarily uh, results in, in the fact that uh, I think that it, it emerges that it becomes the source of, of birth, the source of marriage, the source of, of death. In other words, it carries us into the world and carries us out of the world in a clearly religious, and using your term of religious status is in the total social system sense, uh, context, and yet it is a point of departure that we can track out very clearly um, with respect to the significance for, at a, at a biological and an evolutionary uh, level. So it's just an interesting perspective that I got looking at your uh, video and listening to your comments. The uh, second point that I'd like to make is uh, something about the entire, this entire conference. I'll be very simple and just say that we are emphasizing uh, a, a major problem confronting all of humanity. There's no question about this food problem that we're talking about confronting all of humanity and confronting all the religions of the world. And, and our unusual ability at IRIS, we have a very unusual ability in this regard, of being respectful of the dialogue between religion and science. This is an organization that has always respected the, the significance of the interpretation of the other. This is at the heart of our value system and is at the heart of the antithesis of the loggerhead that you point out in the very beginning of your video between the, the dialogue of the scientists who deny anything about religion and those religionists who deny anything about science. And we're not about that. We're about trying to provide the insights here uh, and have that as a significant part of our values. So that when we talk about science and religion, we're also including the secular side. We're including society in this. And so I'd like to just end with my own slide here, if I can uh, get it up. Uh, I can see the one that I wanted. Uh, this, is, this is one that I presented at Phil's, Phil Hefner, uh, his, uh, uh, this slide right here. Actually, that slide. This is, in fact, I'll present both of them. This, they're, they're very similar. Let's just see. Just two. So, I discovered this was working to get today. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence. Uh, I think I saw you over here someplace, anyway. There you are over here now. Uh, for showing me that this worked again, because it wasn't working yesterday. Oh, <laughs> and this isn't working today. Uh, there we are. Okay, so very simply, um, I would actually, I won't look up at it, because I can look at my screen and be more quickly. Uh, so we're looking at the relationships between science and religion and ethics, and how we balance these arrows of influence is what, is what I gathered uh, and, and have been thinking about in a, in a, it's another kind of a diagram almost that relates to what you exactly what you were talking about, which is that the scientific and, uh, explanation knowing what is in combination with technology, uh, right here, uh, the religious uh, the religion providing the moral basis for deciding what ought to be done. So this is an is ought 
approach to this with regard to ethics and values. And then the knowledge and understanding is a counterbalancing force. In other words, there, there are three arrows here. And ethics provides a method for adjudicating between these competing odds that exists both at the religious levels and at the scientific and at the uh, uh, secular levels. And and my concern is, of course, about the marginalization of traditional religion in light of these explanations of science and the problems that that creates among the arrows of your diagram, the the uh, seven or eight uh, uh, potential. Uh, areas there. And it's my contention that we move in this direction, which is that the arrows become much more balanced. And that's what we're all about. That's what I conceive of this whole enterprise being about, is trying to balance those arrows in your diagram and this chart, for example, that demonstrate these kinds of interactions. So I'll leave it at that. I want to be brief, and I want to call upon my uh, good colleague, Wim Drews, to come up and, uh, and I'll quickly, when well, you're coming up, I'll make sure your slides are on there and uh, so that we can get your comments. as a kind of, uh, well, uh, year that marks many important, or at least in this context, and it has already been mentioned that we have at least two important events, the Barber's book, which is a kind of overview of issues in science and religion, and the beginning as print of the journal, Saigon. And I think there's a lot of affinity, and it has already been pointed out in topics discussed in orientation. I think one of the very basic things is that both are very dedicated to accepting science as the scientists do it, rather than inventing a different science because you are unhappy about what the scientists are doing, but by engaging with real science. Uh, well, uh, the involvement in environment contributed to the very first issue. He was a member, or is a member of the editorial advisory board since the beginning, uh, probably the longest one in that sense connected to the journal. Uh, and he has explicitly also appreciated, also today, I think, uh, expressed his appreciation for Ralph Barrow. Uh, this is a quote from his book, his Gifford Lectures, and also from the uh, one he didn't list in the book, actually, which he kind of revised or expanded edition of Gifford Lectures, which has, again, some historical chapters as had issues. If you ever look for one book, I think that would be the richer one, because it also does the history. Um, okay, so I think there's a lot of affinity uh, and appreciation in both directions, uh, but there's also some difference in focus. I think Ian helped me when I looked in Zeitung articles in 2004, Ian compared uh, the Zeitung Center, not the journal, but the center, uh, and the Center for Theology and Natural Sciences, and a little bit of that transpired today as well. Uh, so while there is a difference in particular interest, uh, the Berkeley group is more interested in physics and cosmology, and that fits the background of the uh, founder and director there, Bob Russell. Uh, but the Zeitung Center has a longer history of focusing on biology, and I think in the theological focus, uh, Berkeley more being into Christian theology and also some other theology, but then it's often the theological, the systematic articulation. And in the Zeitung Center, and I think broader the Irish and Zeitung uh, tradition, uh, more room for the critics of theism as well. Uh, so religious naturalism developed, and also for other traditions and other facets of religion. So for the journal and Iris and Zeitung type of community. Uh, relatively speaking, I think there are differences of emphasis and not exclusive. Uh, more emphasis on anthropology and a more evolutionary understanding of religion as an object of study, not just 
for its theology, for what it says about itself or about the world, but as a phenomenon that deserves to be studied, uh, alongside the discussion about the religious understanding of reality. And he himself, I think, being more about the, the relevance of the ideas of science, the theories of science, in their relevance for theological thinking. Uh, so there is a difference of emphasis as well as a lot of affinity. Um, well, one concern for me as a European, those are in a sense two American things, uh, but uh, it shouldn't be taken to be a vacuum, as if there's nothing else. And of course in the United States there was much else going on, like 1954, the founding of IRIS and, and this Committee on Values of Science, uh, but also in other countries. So the gift lectures were mentioned. Uh, the UK has also Brampton lectures. In the 1950s, there is a famous Catholic series by Masco. Uh, later, after Ian Stark, in a sense, came Arthur Peacock, of course, with also Brampton lectures, which have been very important. Uh, I'm also very much interested, now this in a sense caught between France, the UK, and Germany, uh, in the developments in Germany, because I think that's where one point where I am not I haven't clear, but I, I think I don't agree about the dismissal of this separation category. I think that's mostly coming out of German theology, uh, but there it has its roots in its social context. Uh, say, post-World War I period, disappointment about the liberal theologians in Germany, who had been way too easy going with uh, the German nationalism. And in the post-World War II period, an enormous <coughs> engagement of Christians uh, with questions about nuclear arms and uh, the whole post World War II reconstruction of Germany. There are people like Günther Hohler, Karl Friedrich von Weizsäcker, uh, Georg Pich. There's the Fest, the uh, uh, think tank of the churches, the Protestant churches. I do think that, in a sense, there is driven by this uh, Christian faith and technology issue or uh, a society issue rather than. The theology, the, so it, it starts with this diaconal, and that gives it already quite a different uh, setting. Uh, and I think in that context, being critical of certain developments in society uh, was the beginning. And to be critical, the assertion of independence was important, to have the distance to be critical, and not to be too much into natural theology or, or harmony thinking. The critical thinking was kind of driving, I think, the German engagement. And it was part of what makes theology irrelevant. Because to be irrelevant, you don't need to duplicate the science, but rather to have some distance as well, and something to say of yourself. So I think there, I think, different social contexts, and that's the broader concern for me, I think, different contexts do raise and, and frame the issues differently. And we have seen a very important last 50 years, I think, of development of discussion, and to some extent, that has been an export model. We have seen Ian's book being translated in many languages. I would think Chinese, Russian, and other languages are all, all there. Uh, we have seen uh, the Capital Foundation putting projects that are basically, I think, evaluated by uh, Anglo-American kind of standards, uh, supporting those, particularly elsewhere, and that there is not a, a criticism of what's going on here, but at least a, a, an issue, how to think about it, how it works in different contexts. So this tension between the global and the, the local, I think that's kind of uh, important dimension. I came across the word global as a word that raises this issue about how global issues work out differently in different local contexts. It's not that they're separate, but that they have their own dynamics. Uh, I think that's one of the things that, as far as I'm concerned, is an agenda for the future. It's not so much a criticism of what's going on so far, but it's more something to look after. How can we do more about that? Um, well, to more uh, Zygon itself, indeed, is almost approaching its 50th anniversary. I hope to invite some review articles on, in a sense, in this mindset, to ask people in different regional settings or different disciplinary settings or different confessional settings what in their context is relevant about this this area of discussion and thereby bring in some new voices and new people but there may be other reasons to do first this is especially 
an occasion to celebrate Ian's 19th birthday, approaching birthday. Uh, I counted 14 articles plus some book reviews, which I didn't check in detail. Uh, I think we should be very grateful for the founding role for the modern discussion, agenda setting, structuring. I think if you look at those table of contents of those books, they're highly didactic and they've been in all the first issues. Is well, there are packages of two, four chapters later, it's three chapters for a part and then another. It's very structured, it's very helpful for students and, and readers. Uh, engaging with real science, not to be going after well, very speculative theories or very marginal things. Reflect on the methodological issues, you've done important work there. Incorporating in the earlier book already the history of science. And the other side is technology science. Uh, in a sense, the field science, technology, and society is about the same age, and it's partly a kind of similar development in which Ian has been involved. And there have been, for instance, the World Council of Churches at some point, the Boston Conference. Uh, those kinds of developments are part of it as well. Um, well, if someone turns 90, uh, the question is whether to bring a present. I don't have any particular one. Uh, how do I do this? Physical. Well, uh, oh, it's not on the internet. Well, then I just. Oh, this link, I would like to make it. Uh, the journal Zeitung now produces, or the publisher produces, what we call virtual issues, which means we collect together existing articles and give them an editorial and make those available, freely accessible on the web. And I have now a virtual issue with the 14 articles by Ian as they have appeared in Zeitung. So it should be available on the web now this afternoon, and then it will stay on uh, available, and you find it on the Zeitung page with the Wiley publisher. It has those 14 articles uh, with a brief introduction, uh, introducing a little bit who he and is. I saw by way of a, a birthday present. Uh, I do have the, the table of contents and the editorial printed one copy, so I'm happy to give that to you. Workshops, if there are, there are two that are going on, there's one at the Lake uh, House, and the other one, I'm not sure, That's here. is right here. So, obviously, that one will be delayed as well. But we will continue for a few minutes on this because I think this is an important occasion for Iris, and we certainly want to give an opportunity for QA to be further. So, are there people who would like to line up, first of all? That's what I wanted to know. If there no one, oh, no, yes, yes, okay. Please uh, line up and identify yourselves. I'll get this microphone right over there. Thank you, appreciate that. And then I'll look up on the, get this thing on the uh, website. I think we may have exceeded the memory of my computers. What's happening here? contributions that you've made to the 
success that Zygon is and will be in the future. So this is a new kind of, here, here is the birth of new technology we've had. This is the first time we've been live on the internet also. This is live stream being recorded. This is the first time that a, a specific edition of Zygon can be assembled around a particular theme, and this of course is in honor of your birthday that all of this is taking place. So this is quite a few technological that we can, we can debate the values and the ethics of this, but this is what it is. Uh, and we hope that all of you will, will relish the occasion when we reassemble, by the way, uh, at uh, 4.30 for the happy hour. But until that time, I'm certain there are a few questions and answers that should be done and maybe a couple of announcements about the, about the changes. But let's, let's let that first occur, if you don't mind, since there are people waiting, unless you would like to. Pat, if you would I think some people need to know now, so it will take me first. Yes, seconds. please go. Go ahead. Yes, yes. Pat, Pat makes a, an excellent point, as usual, which is that it needs to be said now, so people... Go ahead, Pat, it's working. Yeah, it's working. Go right into it, yes. Okay. For people who are asking about the religious naturalism session, yes. this is not going to be in Gullen, as was announced erroneously earlier today. It will be down in the boathouse, and it has become part of Maynard Moore's workshop. So if you want to just meet with people who are discussing their religious naturalism in the Irish, that is the place to go. If there's not time to do it, after Maynard's workshop has ended, then Gerald is going to arrange another time when interested people can meet. But the place to go to tap into that conversation is the Motowns at the end of Maynard's workshop. Thank you. Please, come right up and ask your, or make your, but if they're caught, I would prefer that they be questions because we'll, and each person should be very circumspect about the time because there are others behind you and there are others that want to follow you. Am I questioning you or Ian? Whatever you want. No, Ian is the primary. I'm just. <laughs> Everybody will come and then you'll respond. Right. Okay. Um, does evil come into the world with human beings? That is, did the cosmos contain evil before there were human beings? Thank you. We're, I think we're going to take the questions and then he will he will try to do, uh, respond. I think that's realistic under the circumstances. Please go ahead for the next, and then we'll take a series of these. And, and I have a great deal of admiration um, for the work that Ian did with technology, uh, and I would like to know if there's any differentiation between science the way we look at it, and technology, and how we can include more concepts of technology into the future discussion. I'm Mark Fawcett. Um, two quick questions, just uh, partly in response to what happened on the video or what you were talking about on the video. At one point, if I heard you right, you said something to the effect that you don't want to go as far as pantheism. And so I guess as someone who considers myself a naturalist or pantheist, uh, what am I missing out on by being a pantheist and not having this kind of transcendent view of God? Uh, the other is just kind of a clarification of, in your mind, what is the, the distinction between religion and ethics? Uh, because we're in this conference, we're talking a lot about religion, but it's almost become synonymous in some ways in my mind in the way we're talking about it with ethics. Um, is ethics only derived from religion? I mean, certainly there are philosophical attempts to derive ethics from non-religious, purely reason-based uh, ethics and such. So I guess some help on distinguishing uh, religion and ethics would be, would be helpful. Paul Carr, I want to thank uh, Ian for mentioning emergence. We did have two uh, 
Irish conferences on emergence, and it's clearly included that in the in the uh, in the uh, video. And uh, but also, I was quite intrigued by improving the concept of systems thinking, which is even maybe holistic than maybe comes out of holistic. I'd like to learn a little bit more like it about it. Uh, where can I read more? Uh, also. Uh, uh, is that I think a lot of us would like to see that video again, and uh, hopefully it's on YouTube or is it, is it on we YouTube? Have, we have it. We'll put it on the website as well. Yeah, that'd be great to give us the URL. I think we'd all like to see that's worth seeing twice. Yes. Thank you. I, I can bring you a microphone over there. I think I have enough length if you want to sit down and respond. Would you prefer to stand or sit down? I'm going to be. Very brief. That the other meeting we did get started about 20 minutes late, uh, and I think uh, other meetings shouldn't be uh, handicapped because of that. Uh, and we'll be having our um, reception at 4:30, and maybe the, some people can I can respond to some people individually. Then I, I'd like to respond to almost everybody individually uh, on the YouTube uh, thing. Paul mentioned. Uh, I just typed in my name on, on YouTube. Uh, you can also type in, in Wikipedia. If you type in the Wikipedia, they have a sort of biography of me and of some major themes, but then have some references at the bottom that you can go to other websites. Uh, I, I think. Uh, uh, the, the distinction of uh, uh, ethics and religion uh, is a complicated problem. I touched on it somewhat. Uh, maybe if I make a written version of this talk, uh, I can explore that further. Um, on the question of a pamphlet, by a pamphlet, uh, I tend to be what has come to be called panentheism which is in a way sort of a halfway house between pantheism uh, and theism, uh, in which uh, God is uh, not identified with, is more than uh, the whole, uh, but not separate. And, and again, I think that's a complicated issue. I, I, I think I shouldn't uh, hold you all up to that. Meetings. Um, uh, this has been a wonderful session, and I'm very much indebted to Trees for making the virtual barber uh, out of me uh, <laughs> and, and making those, uh, excuse me, making those uh, articles uh, accessible. That's, that's really an amazing new, really new technology, new design on. For some other people too, because I think, uh, I think uh, many people who come here have contributed over the years, and it might be nice to have their thoughts in one place uh, uh, so people could compare, people could see how I might have changed or how to develop. Because I think I have basically kept many of the same themes between the issues book in 66 and the revised version of the given lectures. Uh, but, but I do find new insights and new things coming here. Uh, somebody said that uh, the city was uh, an emergence were treated in one of the uh, uh, one of the issue one of the, one of the summer conferences and I think there has been a quite a lot of interest in that. Uh, and and um, both in terms of uh, emergence in the course of evolutionary history, and also emergence in the development of the organism, in the experience of the of the child of the infant, and often new emphasis on the interaction of the child with other people, the recognition that a child deprived of, uh, of language and the possibilities of, of substitutes. That wonderful scene in the uh, Helen Keller 
movie where Andy Sullivan finally gets across to this blind and deaf woman what a word is and opening up a kind of new level and think that it almost looks like total isolation that a blind and a deaf child has finally breaking through and the little killer gets the symbol for water to recognize it. The whole new world of symbolism that that makes possible. So putting these pieces together is a job for all of us. Luckily we've got several days left to this conference and luckily we'll be also discussing the future of Zygon and whether my vision of keeping both of these tracks. Uh, I've heard some people want to say, well, we ought to go back to the world of just science and religion. But I, I think this immensely rich conference here shows the importance of looking at the technology, in this case, agricultural technologies. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the rest of the week and don't want to hold any meetings. Thank you so much for so much.